Thank you, Eric. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be with you today. And uh, before we dive in this morning, I just very briefly felt um, like the Holy Spirit gave me uh, a specific word that I, I feel led to share um, when Dennis came up and he started speaking. Um, I was immediately taken back to being eight years old and being in that sanctuary over there and listening to Dennis speak and teach about faithfulness and stewardship. And Dennis, I just felt the Holy Spirit prompt me to tell you that you have not just taught about faithfulness and stewardship for the last 20 years. You have modeled it. Um, giving of your time, of your energy, of your effort every single week for 20 years. Um, that has been a ministry in and of itself. Despite anything you've said, despite anything you've talked, you have been so faithful. And I just felt like the Lord wanted you to know that and receive that today. So can we just, can we bless Dennis for the way that he has blessed this community? Thank you. Thank you. Well, guys, again, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Um, this church means so much to me. Um, you know, I grew up in this church, as was mentioned, and when I think back on, on many of the memories that I have here, um, you know, my wife dropped off our three-year-old in what used to be the old youth room that I, I used to go in. I exchanged vows with my wife right here. Um, you know, just so many wonderful memories of this church. And um, as I was really thinking and reflecting on, on being with you guys this morning, um, my hope and my prayer was to be able to give something of life to you in the same way that all of the life has been poured into me through this body. Um, and as we do, I would just like to pray. I would like to start this time just inviting the Holy Spirit into our midst to, to guide our conversation um, this morning. So Lord, we do not do this casually today. This is not just a rote um, routine that we have in our lives of coming to church. Today, Holy Spirit, I am asking you to attend this time. For each and every person, Lord, you know the needs, you know the, the, the lack, you know the, the desperation that so many of us are, are living in. And today, Lord, we just come to the, to the only one who can give us what we truly need. So, Lord, I'm asking you to minister in the way that only you can, that people would receive you, Jesus, as the word. More than anything I say, we, we need you today, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Quick question for you as we get started. How many of you are tired? Honestly. And, and I'm not talking about being tired from staying up too late last night, binging on Netflix or whatever other show you've been watching. I'm talking about internally. How many of you currently are feeling internally exhausted during this season? You see, to be honest, this is how I have been feeling over the last year and a half. It's been exhausting in so many ways. There's been more hurdles in the last year with ministry and general life than I could have imagined stepping into ministry a couple of years ago as a full-time lead pastor. In light of that, you know, I, I know enough to know that I'm not the only one. I know enough to know that each and every one of us is faced with the temptation to live in spiritual fatigue every moment of every day. We're tempted with this in light of the culture we live in. And in light of that exhaustion and in light of that inner battle that we're all facing, I want you to listen to the words of Jesus this morning. Matthew 11 20. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Guys, have you ever assumed something that turned out to be completely and utterly different than your assumption led you to believe? Several years ago, I was leading um, a missions trip 
in Los Angeles, California. Teenagers down there, sounds fun, right? Take a group of 14 teenagers to LA and do inner city ministry. Um, and I remember that on one day, we were going to a specific location to do some ministry, and we had two different vehicles. Um, our, our group was obviously large enough that we needed the transportation of two vehicles. So I walked up to the other leaders, and I said, okay, guys, here's the address. Write it down. Gave it to them, hopped in the car. We plugged it in and, and went. Now, um, if you've ever driven in downtown Los Angeles, you'll know that caravanning is impossible. Um, there's no way with the traffic, with the speed, with how many cars, the congestion, we got separated at some point. So we both had it in our GPS. We're both going that way. So I drive, and we get to the location, and I'm thinking, okay, where, where's the other group? So I call them, and they're like, yeah, we're here. Where are you guys? And I said, no, I'm, I'm here. Where are you guys? Um, and I said, what, what address did you plug in? So they began to read it, and it sounded right, and then they got to the zip code. Um, so everything was right until the zip code came, and it was a wrong zip code. So they had driven about an hour in the opposite direction. Um, so we went and did our ministry thing, and they hurried back, and right as we finished up, um, they walked in exhausted after about three hours in the car total. So, um, you know, when I think about that story, when I think about this example, the, the number one thing that it brings to my remembrance is that assumptions can be dangerous. Assumptions can be very dangerous. You see, the, the driver assumed the zip code. I gave them the address, and they assumed the last piece without fully checking it. And I would challenge us today in saying that as people who are following Jesus, we too often end up in places we never thought we would be simply because we have made some very dangerous assumptions about the words of Jesus. Jesus has said specifically, come to me, come to me. But we as his followers, I believe, have often misunderstood what it even means to be with Jesus. Further, while we want the rest, I mean, I don't, I don't know a person living in, in, in today's world that doesn't want the rest that Jesus is offering, but the problem is we don't know what that rest is. And equally concerning, we don't know how to enter into it. So today, above all else, we're going to challenge some assumptions so that we actually might learn how to take hold of this invitation this beautiful, wonderful invitation that Christ has given us for eternal rest in our souls. Now, there's two primary questions that I, I really think have to be dealt with if we are going to experience Jesus' rest. And by answering these questions, we're going to be able to deal with our assumptions and, and therefore fully enter into what Jesus is offering to us. So as we talk about these questions, I want you to keep this, this framework in the back of your mind that Jesus has invited you to rest. How do we enter into it? What is that rest? So the first question is this, how do we come to Jesus? We all want to come to Jesus. The question is how. When Jesus has come to me, each one of us likely has a different picture of what that might look like in our personal relationship with him. And in order for us to truly get at this, we're going to have to pause for a minute. We're going to have to hit the pause button. And I want to define some terms before we move forward so that when I say a word, I know that we're on the same page. Okay, the first term that I want to define, it'll come on the screen, is discipleship. Discipleship, which when I say discipleship, this is what I mean. Engaging in the processes and practices that Jesus did with the intent to become as Jesus is. Okay, when I'm talking about discipleship, that's what I'm thinking of. Engaging in the processes, doing the actual things that Jesus actually did with the purpose of becoming like him. In other words, we're giving ourselves to these specific actions, these active exercises that we believe are going to actually produce growth in us, produce character and inner transformation. Now, that's the first term. The second term I want to define is spiritual formation, which I am defining as anything that forms you. Anything 
that forms you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, into the kind of person that you are currently becoming. Now, why am I defining these two terms differently? Is it because they're inherently and absolutely different in the biblical text? No, they're actually not. In fact, discipleship and spiritual formation should be synonymous. However, within our Christian culture, these two terms have become viewed in very different lights. For instance, in watering down the gospel, things like character development, things like virtue, things like obedience to Christ, inner transformation, and so on, they've become optional. They've become these things that we tack on to the end of Christianity for those who are really, really passionate, who are really, really committed. And that is why, sadly, we can have a person who participates in what we would call discipleship for 10, 20, even 50 years, but still lack any sort of inner transformation of being deeply changed by the gospel and taking on the life of Jesus that he died for us to live in. We mistakenly believe, guys, that doing the right things will always yield the right results, but it's not so simple. And while we are the ones who have to participate, no one can do your discipleship for you. It is God, however, who takes those actions, breathes upon them, and uses them to spiritually form us into his likeness and into his image. And if you consider with me um, just the process of taking a shower, I believe that that process, that simple process, can actually shed a whole bunch of light for us on what the spiritual life actually looks like. You see, the reason we can all relate to this is hopefully taking a shower is something we all do. And if you don't, um, there's no judgment here, but I, I hope this is something we can all connect to in our own way. Um, you know, for instance, when you get in the shower, while we are the ones who do the scrubbing, it is actually the soap that does the cleaning. For instance, you can get in a shower and you can scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub all day long, but without soap, your scrubbing will not make you clean. And this is a perfect picture of our best attempts at discipleship without the spiritual formation that only comes from the breath of the Spirit. We can scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub. We can do all the right things. We can try really hard. We can read our Bible every day. We can pray. We can go to worship services. We can join a small group. We can get involved in every possible area and still not look like Jesus. So what does this mean for us? We mistakenly believe that coming to Jesus is what happens when we participate in the deeds of discipleship. So coming to Jesus is going to church. Coming to Jesus is reading my Bible. Coming to Jesus is doing one of these activities, fasting, praying, whatever it might be. And the problem here is that our best attempts at discipleship without the Holy Spirit doing the work leads to nothing but just our own striving so when we go to these different things, when we, when we participate in these different activities, we're actively doing something that is supposed to grow our faith. And what I would say to us and challenge us in this morning is that while spiritual disciplines are certainly a part of what it means to come to Jesus each day, and to my own church, I've, I've talked in depth about spiritual disciplines, and I know you guys have as well, the importance of being someone who is consistently coming to Jesus in those ways, but, and there's a big but there, those things and those things alone, they fall utterly short in describing the type of life that I believe Jesus has called each and every one of us to. So I want you to think about this, this spiritual formation with me for a moment, and and part of this is, is interesting because if you go back to the definition that I, that I gave, spiritual formation is not inherently Christian. In other words, spiritual formation is neutral. It's unbiased 
I can tell you with confidence that each and every one of us is currently being formed in some sort of way spiritually and influenced in a, in a, in a real way during this season of your life. There's an American theologian and scholar, his name's Kevin Van Hooser, and he, curr- he just recently, um, he said, culture is in the full-time business of spiritual formation. And what he means is that we are constantly being influenced. We are constantly being formed into specific types of people by the forces around us, whether we're aware of it or not, and whether the transformation that we experience is godly, or whether that transformation is worldly, entirely depends on what we are giving ourselves to. And while God constantly looks to conform us into his image, we have a culture and a world that is constantly seeking to malform us into its own distorted image, into its own just altered view. And Paul actually specifically warned of this. I want you to look with me at Romans 12, 2. And for most of us, we've probably heard this passage before. But I want, to, I want to just ask you to look at this with fresh eyes today. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So Paul warns us quite abruptly about being integrated into the behaviors and the customs of this world. And I believe that that warning is especially necessary for us in light of yet another assumption that so many believers make. Most followers of Jesus, you know, I've, as Eric said, I I know I look younger than I am. I'm almost 30. And I'm telling you, in the last 10 years, if if I could say one thing that I've, I've had come up so many times is just, you know, I've, I've done this and this and this and this. I still just feel disconnected from God. And you know, I think that where this root is, where we find that there's this divergence from what we think we ought to do and what we're actually experiencing in life, we find that we deeply believe that spiritual formation only happens when we're active. We believe that when we are active, that is the moment. Those are the times that we are being changed. In other words, we believe that we only change as people when we're doing the things we mentioned. When we're praying, we're changed. When we're reading the Bible, we're changed. When we worship. When the truth is that the vast majority of our formation, the vast majority of our change as people is taking place when we are passively going about life. You know, Steph, Steph, my wife, and I started dating in high school, and uh, we quickly learned that we did things a little bit differently. And, you know, I can remember during those high school years on the weekends, I spent a lot of time over at her house, and she spent a lot of time over at my house. And I'll give you an example of some of these differences. The, f- the first thing that I noticed when we were dating that gave me just a little bit of a red flag was that Steph would do the dishwasher's job for it. And I don't know if you've met someone like this, but, it, but for me at 16 years old, it was troubling, okay? I believed that the dishwasher loved its job and because it, it literally was only made to do one job. It was to wash dishes. But here I see my girlfriend over here and she's washing a dish and then puts it in the dishwasher and I said, hey, Hey, Steph, what are you doing? She was like, well, this is, this is how I load the dishwasher. I said, but, but now it's clean. So we had this conversation, and, and, you know, it was just always this thing of, like, she would look at me and be like, those dishes are too dirty for the dishwasher. I'd be like, nope, that's what a dishwasher does. And we had this back and forth when we first got married, and it just went on and on and on until one day I shut the dishwasher, And I caught myself, and I stood in horror, realizing that I just washed every single dish that I had put into that dishwasher before I started it. Now, what's important to realize is that Steph didn't manipulate me. She didn't coerce me. She didn't put a gun to my head. She didn't threaten me in any way to load the dishwasher the way that she had loaded it. I had just observed I had just been around her. 
I had just seen what she did, and slowly over time, I was influenced. And without even being aware of it, things began to change in our house. Now, guys, here's the point, and the point is very important. Who we give ourselves to, what we give ourselves to on a daily basis changes us. Changes us. So here's my question. Let's take a hypothetical person, and let's say that this hypothetical person is consistent, and they spend at least 10 to 20 minutes a day with Jesus, whether it's before they start their day, mid-break, in the evening, whatever it is, whatever their routine is. Let's say that they're consistent every single day. But that same person spends an hour and a half, maybe two hours every evening listening to Sean Hannity or Anderson Cooper. My question is this, who do you think it is that's forming them? Is Jesus forming them more in 15 minutes than Anderson Cooper or Sean Hannity is in two hours? I would argue no. You see, we have to realize that this is deeper than we thought it was. Proverbs 4, 20 through 23 actually plays at this. It, it reminds us in saying, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And guys, this passage reveals to us something important that probably every single one of us, including myself, needs to be aware of and reminded of today, that our heart above everything else is what determines the course of our lives. So my question again is, what words are currently forming your heart? Which words are penetrating deeply into your soul? You see, with the use of technology, um, you know, in ways that we couldn't have done 15, 20 years ago, we can now invite folks into our living rooms. We can invite them into our cars and our headphones, and we just allow them to influence us. We say, come on in. We welcome their voices. We listen to their podcasts. We read their books. We read their blogs and their social media posts and so much more that is forming us all passively, by the way. We have to realize, guys, that all of our actions, not just the ones that we pick and choose to form us, are playing a role in the people we're becoming. And by overlooking that particular truth, is it any wonder to us why we feel exhausted? You see, Christian discipleship, has, has, it's become another thing to do for a very busy group of people. I don't know about you, but raising two little kids, pastoring a church, dealing with a lot of other things on my plate, school, whatever, it's busy. And if we're not careful, discipleship becomes another check in the box, another to-do list feature in our lives, instead of realizing that there's another option here. And again, just, just another example here. I really wish I had a, had a count of how many times I've had someone either visit, visit our church or meet with me after a service and say, man, that service really ministered to me, that message, that worship time, it was, it was great. I'm, I'm interested in learning more about your church. What do you guys do here for discipleship? And without being snarky or anything, I, I typically will just be honest in saying, well, um, some of the things we do is you know, first of all, we listen to the word every single week, and it's forming us. We also worship together through song, through giving, through testimony each and every week, and it's forming us. We pray together. We take communion uh, together every single week, and it's forming us. Now, please hear me. Formation doesn't happen just when we want it to. Formation is happening every of every day, and we think that we go to church, we go to here, we go to here. Those are just things we do. What are you guys doing for discipleship? We have to change how we think about this. And the reason why is because Jesus modeled it in his own ministry. Think about Jesus for a moment. Jesus didn't approach his disciples and ask if they would consider attending a Monday, Monday night Torah study. He didn't say, okay, come on Mondays from 7 to 8.30, attend this meeting, and your life is going to be transformed. He said, no, leave your family. I want you to leave everything, and I want you to follow me. I want you to do 
everything with me, every minute of every single day. And guys, that's how we begin to realize what it means to come to Jesus. Coming to Jesus isn't this complicated thing. It's simply living all of our lives with a constant awareness of and connection to the presence of God. And when we begin to do everything in our lives, from work to relationships, from difficulties to celebrations, all with Jesus in real time, then we find that we truly do have the ability to be transformed into his image. We find that we actually do have the ability to rest in who he is, not by our doing, not by taking credit for how disciplined we are, but by the work of the Spirit. And just as the disciples were transformed through daily life, it wasn't as though they just looked to one moment and said, that's when I was transformed. No, they did life with Jesus for three years, every moment of every day. Now, what did they do in those years? Well, they watched Jesus, they talked to Jesus, they asked questions of Jesus, they made mistakes in front of Jesus, they were taught by Jesus, they denied Jesus, they failed Jesus, and they repented to Jesus. So, in the same way, you and I can do every single one of those things with Jesus every minute of every day. What does that mean for us? It means that we have this constant availability to go to Jesus instead of going to the other things that we've been looking to for rest. We all look for rest somewhere. We all look for something to fill us back up. And after telling his followers that he will provide rest, and what does Jesus get in exchange? He offers rest, but what does he get back from his followers? Well, he takes their weariness. He takes their heaviest burdens, and Jesus tells them to take a yoke upon them. Now, if you know anything about a yoke, a yoke is like this wooden cross piece that was fastened over the neck of, of two different animals, and it was attached to a plow. It was attached to a cart um, that they would pull to plow the fields and do heavy work. So why in the world is Jesus talking about a yoke? He, he's talking about rest. He's talking about giving, giving, taking burdens in exchange for rest. He says, take my yoke. So, why is he talking about this? Well, partially, I think very clearly Jesus is comparing his light and easy yoke with the heavy yoke of religion that has crippled the people of his day. And Jesus is telling them that as a new high priest, he is bringing a different yoke for his people. And this new yoke, it's not enslaving like the one they're experiencing now. It's not taxing. It's not impossible to hold up. No one could live up to the yoke that the Pharisees were putting on the people. But there's also more to what Jesus is saying here. Sometimes believers I have found get so caught up in talking about the easy yoke of Jesus, the easy yoke, we need to live in the easy yoke, that we completely forget that Jesus actually has a yoke. He actually has a yoke, which means that we can't just talk about life being easy. We can't just talk about things being utterly simple and, and, and overtly um, easy in life. What that means is that we're called to obey Christ. Even though his, his yoke is easy, there, there is still a burden there of following through on the, on the commands of Jesus. And this invitation for rest, it's given to all who are weary everyone who's weighed down. It doesn't matter what's doing the way down in your life. So my question is this, what's weighing you down right now? What is it that right now in your life is weighing you down? What are the burdens that you're carrying today? Is it the burden of past guilt for sin? Come to Jesus. Is it heavy relationships that, that aren't going the way you thought they were? Come to Jesus. Is it worry or anxiety over money or the future? Come to Jesus. His yoke is easy. I don't know about you, but there's, there's times where I get tired of, of the weights that come and go in life, the stresses and the strains that just seem to not end. We have a person named Jesus who has said, I will take that from you, and I will give you rest. So we've answered this first question, how do we come to Jesus? Well, we come to Jesus by living every moment 
of every single day with an awareness that God is longing to be with us. He's longing to teach us and to transform our hearts so we can be like him. That means he wants to be with you in your drive to work. He wants to be with you in the arguments that you have with your spouse. Can I hear an amen? He wants to be with you in every moment of every day. And by answering that question, we, we've, exposed this false, this, we've exposed this faulty assumption that coming to Jesus, it only happens through discipline activity. From here, we now have the ability to... to to talk about this second question before we close, and that's this. What is the rest that Jesus is inviting us to live in? So we know how to come to Jesus by not just trying to do a few things here, there, a few times a week. No, every minute of every day, being aware. What is the rest he's inviting us to live in? Now, we can start tomorrow. You can start today, actually, in living every moment of your life before Jesus right now, allowing him to be the one who informs you, informs you the, the most about who you are and what your life should be. But if we misunderstand the kind of rest that Jesus is looking to give to us, then we'll continue to live exhausted. We'll continue to feel spiritually fatigued time and time again. And uh, I have a, one, one very important question for you, and that is, is there anyone else here, I found that I am vastly in the minority here, but is there anyone else here who does not like taking a nap? You are my people, okay? Represent you seven people who just raised your hand. You are my people, okay? And let me, ex- let me explain why I hate naps. Um, in this season of life, got a three-year-old and a one-year-old, two little girls, and they, um, they're wide open most of the time. So I find that when I have a little bit of free time, um, I feel like it's wasted, if I take a nap, because I have things that I'd like to do, I'd like to, to do other things. Um, and not only do I feel like a nap causes me to sleep away that little bit amount of time, I also wake up in a bad mood every single time. You can ask my wife. I give you permission to ask her. Yeah, I, I, Nathan is in a bad mood anytime he, he takes a nap. Um, and after I wake up from that nap, I, I almost feel more tired. Have you ever had that experience? You take, you're like exhausted, you take a nap, and you wake up and you're like, man, I'm just more tired than I was before. You see, some of us can relate to that, not just physically, but even spiritually. Sometimes when we're spiritually dry, when we're exhausted internally, we will resort to taking a spiritual nap. We'll take a break from spiritual activity. I'm just too tired. But what we find when we do this is that we're actually only more tired afterwards. We find that really we have to, we have to think about rest differently. I've learned in my own life that rather than taking a nap, maybe I won't do that, I will find something else to do that'll feed my soul. Maybe it's reading a book. Maybe it's going and playing my guitar. Maybe it's, maybe it's doing something else that, that's just to, to be replenished, to be refilled. So guys, we have to think about this differently and we have to learn that some areas of our lives, they are in fact connected when we haven't considered them to be connected. For what I mean is we can't live physically hurried and exhausted every moment of every single day and expect that we're gonna live lives of spiritual rest. We can't have it both ways. We wanna burn the candle at both ends in our bodies but then our spirits are just singing ooh-la-la every moment of every day in Christ. And sincerely, guys, we cannot consider rest as just a lapse in activity. That's not the rest that Jesus is necessarily calling you to. Just stop. Just, just take, take a spiritual nap. Just do this. It's not just a ceasing of all movement and requirements. The rest that Jesus is inviting us to live in It's a rest that can actually be experienced in the midst of your busiest moments, in the midst of your greatest difficulties. I want to read uh, 2 Corinthians 4.16. Paul says, that is why we never go up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. And if you read this chapter, you find that there are two vital truths for us as God's people to embrace about this rest. From Jesus. And the first is that Christ's eternal rest is not determined by how you're presently feeling or what you're presently experiencing. 
when we feel overwhelmed, when we experience anxiety, and we want nothing more than rest, we'll look to something internally to fix it. We will turn internally to find a solution, but we can't. Have you ever tried to change your thoughts? Have you ever tried to change your mindset through sheer willpower? But the problem is, guys, we need something that we don't possess. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. What that means, guys, is that there is two different kinds of peace that you might experience in your life. What that means is there is a kind of peace that the world can offer you. I don't give peace as the world gives implies that there is a form of peace that the world does give. But what does this mean? It means that Jesus' rest, it means that Jesus' peace is stronger than circumstance because you'll find that the peace of the world is rooted in circumstance. When things are going really well, when your circumstances are good, when your family's doing well, when the job is going well, when all relationships are firing on all cylinders, that is when we can experience the peace the world gives because things are good. But we find that when things go differently, when we are experiencing trial, when we are experiencing something that we wish we weren't, that's when we need a different kind of peace. That's when we need a peace that only Jesus can give. And we find that this rest, it will not come by simply turning away from the emotions that we're feeling, but instead by fully feeling them and allowing the Spirit of God to overwhelm them. Paul continues to talk about this in 2 Corinthians 4. 17 through 18, he says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So what is this second truth regarding Jesus' rest that he's offering to us? Well, secondly, it's, it's this, eternal rest happens in the present, but it comes from the future. That might sound a little bit odd, but what I mean by, by that is this. We're here in the present right now. You're, you're all here right now. And God reminds us that our lives are actually bigger than what we currently see right now in this particular moment. He reminds us that he has redeemed our past. He reminds us that uh, our present is alive right now, and he, and he holds it in his hands. And he also promises that the future of redemption that is set aside for every one of his children is then able to break through any current moment that you need it, any current moment of difficulty so that we can begin to live lives of rest no matter what. So as we close, how do we come to Jesus? How do we enter into a lifestyle, not just a moment, a lifestyle of coming to Jesus and receiving his rest? Guys, we have to think about doing life with God differently. We can't think about just checking off a few boxes here and there and expecting that we're going to be filled constantly with the sense of God being with us. We have to live every moment of every day in his presence. And secondly, what is the rest? It's to externally receive the peace that only Jesus offers, to look externally where we lack, where we, instead often we've been looking internally. One last passage as, as we wrap up here, Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. So here's the final question. How is it that Jesus, how is it that God can say, come to me? All you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, for I'm humble and gentle at heart. How can, how can God say that in Matthew 11? And then in Matthew 16, just five chapters later, he says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me and die. How can he say both of these things, and how can they both be true at the same time? Well, I believe it's because Jesus' rest is not what we thought it was. I believe it's because coming to Jesus is not what we believed it was. I preached this message to my, my congregation 
handful of months ago, and I, and I told my people what I'll tell you today, that if I could preach one message or a variation of it, and I only could pick one for the rest of my life, this would probably be it. And I'll tell you why. Because I have found that no matter how determined, no matter how committed people are and how much they desire to be like Jesus, the way that we think about becoming like Jesus is flawed. We think that we can do a couple of things, put a little bit of Jesus and sprinkle it over our agenda or our schedule, but most of the time we're being formed by the culture. Most of the time we're being formed by the conversations. How do we expect that a 10-minute prayer session with Jesus of asking him to fill our lives with this is going to overwhelm the two hours of gossip that we entered into at work four hours later? We have isolated our lives into these boxes where Jesus is a box, and we put things in occasionally to feel better about ourselves. And I do not say this to condemn a single person. I say this because I'm preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to myself this morning, and I'm telling you that every single one of us needs to be convicted and repent of the fact that Jesus has more for us. He has a life that is rooted not in striving, not in regulatory action like the Pharisees taught, but a life of grace, a life that's not rooted in our getting credit for how mature we are. Maturity only comes from the Spirit, and you can't earn it. You can simply be faithful in it. So as we come to a close this morning, I'd like to end with just the words of Paul and and invite us to realize that this can be true for us in this season. Even if our circumstances look as though we're dying, as we carry a cross, Jesus said, come to me, pick up your cross. Maybe it looks like we're weighed down. Maybe it looks like we're going up a hill that we can't conquer. Paul says, may we remember that the lives that we have in Christ, that even if our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. May our souls experience the deepest rest of Jesus Christ as we learn to come to him every day. I just want to invite you to bow with me as we come to a close and I just have a few final questions and thoughts for you to, to talk to the Lord about privately. How can you begin to view coming to Jesus differently this week? How can you begin to think about your life with God differently today? Who is it that's forming you? What is it that's forming you? What conversations? Are they conversations with Jesus? Are they conversations with with media? Are they... Is it messages you're reading? Is it, is it podcasts you're listening to? Is it, is it Jesus Christ or is it something else? Because those are the two options. Secondly, what, what burdens do you need to release to Jesus today as you come to him? Because Jesus reminds us that we can't just rest while we hold the old yoke. We come to him and we exchange our burdens for his rest. So what, what do you need to give to God today? Is there some of you today that you need to give past pain to him that maybe you've never fully released? That it's still been a yoke that you've been wearing? Maybe it's present difficulty. Maybe you have a situation right now that you're going through that it has been eating you alive. It has been taking up your thought life. It has been been just controlling your, your current situation. Maybe it's worry about the future. Maybe it's anxiety. How are things going to shake up in the next year? How, what's going to happen with my retirement? What, what about my kids? What about, let me just tell you, come to Jesus today. He wants to give you rest right now. And lastly, how can you begin to enter into eternal rest from Jesus this week? I want to challenge you and remind you that rest is not a finite experience that we often think. You know, I love vacation, but you know what? Towards the end of every vacation, I think, oh, man, it's coming to an end. I've got to go back. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got, I'm already filling the blanks of the things that are, that are coming. But guys, that's, that's not what Jesus has called us to. He's not calling us to spiritual vacation. He's calling us to do life reliant upon his presence every single moment. 
So Lord, we, we receive the infinite resource of rest today. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in this moment that we would be challenged and shaped. That rest is not just this thing that, that is far off and, and impossible. And I'll, I'll finally get to rest when this thing passes. When, when I'm done with this. When I'm finished with that. When this finally gets straightened out. No. Lord, help us to see that you're offering it to us right now. Right now. We receive it. We love you, Lord. And I just speak blessing over each and every person here. We ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much.